And now we have the privilege to turn to God's words. Tonight we turn to the book of Amos. Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. We want to start reading at verse 1. Amos 8, verse 1. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, declares the Lord God. So many dead bodies. They are thrown everywhere. Silence. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor, to the, uh, poor of the land to an end saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain and the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff for the wheat? The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, Surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Wow. When a country is corrupt, when a people are corrupt, and the Lord says, surely I will never forget any of their deeds? Wow! Shall not the land tremble on this account, and everyone mourn who dwells in it, and all of it rise like the Nile, and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or of thirst, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. In that day the lovely virgins and the young men shall faint for thirst. Those who swear by the guilt of Samaria and say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Our text comes tonight from verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Dear fellow Christians, We have entered a strange time. It has been a strange year. Early in the year, you know the confusion that was out there. Early in the year, in your local stores, there ended up showing up some noticeable shortages. There was a time period where you could hardly buy toilet paper. Whole rows would be empty, and even in those big stores. Meanwhile, some other people were stockpiling and squirreling it away for themselves. But you can survive without toilet paper. 
And then there were times when couldn't get eggs and couldn't get milk and couldn't get pork and couldn't get this and couldn't get that. And you wondered, has America become the land of famine? No, no, no. And then you witnessed that out west, farmers were taking good crops, good vegetable crops, cabbages and lettuces and whatnot all, and they were plowing them under because the processing plants were shut down. And the stores were going wanting. Dairy farmers. Wisconsin and some in Michigan forced in their dairy barns to open the tap on that big bulk tank and let it all go down in the drain because the creameries couldn't handle it. They were stockpiled full and none of it was getting to the stores. Having connections with some of those folks out west I saw pictures as they sent them to me of hogs that had been shot. Piles and piles and piles, 30 feet high and 60, 70 feet long, waiting for the bulldozer because those hogs could not go to market. The processing plants were shut down because of a virus. And when those hogs get up over 325 pounds, the machines in the factories, never mind the people, the machines cannot handle a carcass that big. And the farmers had no choice but to shoot them. Well, other people couldn't get any meat. And from the South Dakota, farmers that we have corresponded with saw pictures of baby pigs. They kill them. They don't even wait. Why waste the food? Is it a time of famine in the land? No, but because we're so specialized, because of the obstacles we put in the way ourselves, the food does not get to the hungry. But you wouldn't call it a famine. I had a couple men in my congregation in South Dakota who said, when they were growing up, they remember famine. They had eight kids in the family, and dad and mom were trying their best to scrabble out a living, and dad had taken wooden crates, and he pounded them to the gables on the one end of the barn and on the other end of the barn. Pounded those wooden crates up there in the gables so that the pigeons would nest up there. And every morning, the boys were supposed to put the ladder up there and get the eggs so Mama would have a little bit of something to put as protein for a breakfast. Are we in time of famine? No, we're not. The time of Amos, were they in a time of famine? No, they were not. Mind you, and maybe you remember that on August the 16th, we had a message on chapter 7 of Amos. Amos was a prophet from Amos was a prophet from the south country. He came into Israel, the north country. But Israel was doing great. It was being ruled by Jeroboam, the son of Joash. And he was on the throne, and he was at the height of his power. He had a great army. He was spreading the expanse of Israel, north and south and east and west, and he was doing great. And the economy was booming, and people were leaving the farms, and they were leaving the sheep pastures, and they were coming into the cities, and they were all pursuing the great Samaritan dream. They wanted to make money, but... As you perhaps remember, in the days of Amos, down beneath the surface, beneath the surface of that culture was wickedness and greed, touched on it even in that passage. Price gouging, cheating, swindling, slander, divorce, 
promiscuity, wickedness afoot. And the people were having such a great time because they were all making money, or most of them anyway. And they didn't want to hear the words of the Lord. And through the prophet, false prophet Amaziah, they told the true prophet Amos, just go on home. We don't want you here. And then these words. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Only two parts to the text this evening. First, your physical bread. And second, your spiritual food. Ready? Your physical bread. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. The Hebrew word for famine is actually the word hungering. Plug it in. The Lord says, I will send a hungering on the land. Do you have any hungering? Think now for a moment. What might be in your refrigerator at home? Is it bare or there's some nice things there? What might be in the freezer at home? What might be in the cupboard? Do you have a pantry? Do you have a pantry out in the garage or in the basement? Second pantry? Is there anyone here that thinks that they're going to go hungry tonight? Is there anyone in America that's going to go hungry? Why, if you don't have food, and if you don't have a paycheck, and if you don't have unemployment, at least you can go to some soup kitchen or you can file for food stamps and go on welfare. Is there anyone hungry in America? We got the opposite problem. There's so much food around, you and I don't know how to use it all. How often does food go into the garbage or into the compost or were donated to the domestic animals? Some moms have problems feeding their families. Because sunny boy doesn't like this. And little girl doesn't like that. And they don't like this vegetable. And they don't like that vegetable. And they don't like raisins. And they don't like... Meanwhile, in America, you can even have fussy domestic animals so that you got to buy premium dog food and gourmet cat food. We know nothing of a famine of that sort, do we? Back to the text. Catch the words on the land. I will send a famine on the land. That's different than a famine in your house. Because if you have a famine in your house, you can go to the neighbors at least and borrow a dozen eggs or a gallon of milk or some bread, right? Your neighbors are nice folk, aren't they? And if you have a famine in one locale, at least you can go to another locale. And if your local grocery store is here, don't, well, then you just go to another grocery store, right? But this does not say uh, famine in the house or famine in the district, but it says a famine in the land. Folks, you and I do not know what that is. Many of those who, in this congregation too, are alert to history, you know that during World War II, the Third Reich and that machine, that machine that Germany put together, was pushing west, 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 across Netherlands and Belgium and France, all the way to the English Channel. But it was also pushing east. 
It pushed east across Poland, across Belarus and Ukraine, all the way to Russia. What happened? It got as far into Russia as up to Moscow, and in the north, up to Leningrad or St. Petersburg. And then what happened? God brought in the Russian winter and stopped the Germans. They never did conquer Moscow. They tried and tried and tried to conquer Leningrad. They even bombed Lake Odessa, where they were bringing trucks across the ice in the winter to feed the people in the town. And the bombs never broke the ice because the ice was nine feet thick. In Leningrad, the siege lasted for 900 days. And the people got so hungry, they started to eat the dead and to eat sawdust pancakes. I guess that's what you would call a diet of high fiber and low protein. But still, famine afflicts this one or that one. When I was in Ukraine, and your pastor CJ was there numerous times, same town, Donetsk, a city of two million people. I remember it was a November Saturday, just before we were wrapping up classes, and a couple other teachers that were from St. Louis, they were with me, and they wanted to go stop at the marketplace, and we went out to the marketplace, open air. And the Russian people would bundle up with their coats and whatnot all, and grandpas and grandmas trying to sell a little bit this or a little bit that, or some cabbages yet, or some frozen fish, or some little handy thing that some grandma made. But it was so cold there, and the wind was so blustery, and it was few snowflakes in the air, and it was miserable. And after being in that open-air marketplace, think Russian flea market, we had to leave, and we had to hurry back to the bus drop to get the bus back to that ramshackle apartment we were in. And as I'm walking along, trying to keep with these, up with these two long-legged teachers from St. Louis, I'm running along, almost running, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a sight. I wrote it off as just another Ukrainian beggar. She was about 25 years old. She was sitting there on some steps. We were right past her knees. All these passerbyers coming back from the market had to go right on past her. And she had a hand out, a cold hand with red fingers. She had this hand out right over the top of her knees, hoping that somebody would put a couple kopecks, a couple coins, or a loaf of bread in her hand. And as I'm hurrying along, because Ukraine had hundreds and hundreds of beggars, you can't help them all, can you? As I'm hurrying along, out of the corner of my left eye, I see two things that caught my attention. The bulge beneath her coat was really big. And then I saw something else, just as I'm walking past, out underneath the edge of that coat stood, were two little feet. She was not begging for one, she was begging for two. Folks, we don't know what famine is. But when the Lord talks here, he talks, he's not going to send to that land of Israel a land of a famine of bread. Nor, he adds in the text, right there in your verse, of thirst of water. How long do you think you can go without water? I'm astounded in many ways. Almost every church I preach in, maybe there's only been one exception, has a visiting pastor 
somebody on the team of the local church has made sure that there's a little bit of water right here in case, as a speaker, my lips get a little bit dry. And in this case, somebody even put in ice cubes. Oh, how we are pampered. Right? How long can you go without water? If you don't have anything to drink, what in 24 hours, what's going to happen? Your mouth is going to get dry and you're going to have trouble moving your tongue because your tongue isn't going to cooperate with the words. If you're out of water, out of fluid, any kind, for 48 hours, what's going to happen? You're going to start to get dizzy and your heart is going to really start to do the skippy thing. If you're without water, if you have a loved one go on hospice care, you might see it, eh? If you go without water three, four, five, six days, you're next to done and next to dead. Could you live without food for a month? Probably. Could you live without water for a week? Doubt it. Back to the text. How long could you live without the Word of God? Put it another way. Do you crave the Word of God more than your food and more than your drink? Because you know that the Word of God speaks about the Christ, and he, to know Christ, is to have life eternal. Physical food, you can do without it. Spiritual food, point two, no, you can't. What does the Lord say here? Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. But what happens, dear friends? What happens when there's no hunger for that word? Does that affliction have anything to do with what's going on in America today? I used to live in a parsonage right beside the church. And I did not witness some of the other stuff that was going on on Sundays to get from home to church. Tonight, I'm traveling from home to church, coming on up this road. I was astounded at how many cars and stores and whatnot all was going on in that main stretch right there between here and the freeway. I was astounded. What should God do if there's no hunger for his word? What would a mom do if there's no hunger? Let's say, push it to the extreme. Let's say a mom makes a nice, beautiful chocolate cake, puts it on the counter and says, just because I'm in a good mood, have at it, family, whenever you want. And at the end of the week, only a couple slivers are out of that and there's green mold growing up the side. What's mom supposed to do? Let's say she doubles down, and the next day, the next week, she puts on another chocolate cake, and it's got thicker frosting, and she's got chocolate pudding in the middle, and it's scrumptious, and it's there on the counter. Anyone can eat it, and nobody touches it. A tiny sliver is out. What should she do? Let's say she goes to the third week and really pushes up the ante, and she makes this one absolutely, absolutely gourmet and deluxe, and it's even got Bavarian cream in the middle. Who can resist that? And if nobody touches that one, what's Mama going to do? It's going to go to the cats, or it's going to go to the dog, but she's not going to do it the fourth week. What does God do? when people don't want his word. He takes it away. 
Simple. Prodigal son, you know that story. Luke chapter 15. That prodigal son, acting like a spoiled brat, demanded of his dad, I want my inheritance early. So dad, dad complied, and he divided the inheritance. Never mind, that was part of dad's pension. That was dad's old age fund. He divided that inheritance. He gave that youngest son his part of the inheritance. And he promptly went off to a wild city with wild living and wild parties and wild women and wild lifestyle. And soon the inheritance was gone. Then he realized what he used to have. After it was gone. How many people in the world realize what they have lost after it is gone? King Saul, remember him? He had a lot of gusto at times, but he didn't have very good hearing. The Lord would give him messages through prophet Samuel. And he didn't listen to this part, and he didn't listen to that part, and he went charging ahead on this thing, or charging ahead on that thing. And finally, what happens? God takes the word away. And at the end of his life, King Saul is so desperate for a word of, 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 of direction from the spiritual world, he even went to the witch of Endor to ask for the ghost of Samuel to tell him something. What happens when the word of God is rejected? God takes it away. What happened when... It, Prophet Amos is sent to Samaria. Chapter 7, verse 12, if you want to look it up. The false prophet Amaziah says, Flee away! Flee away to that south country! Go back home! We don't want you here and your word of the Lord. What happened? Amos went home. What happened? Prosperity continued for another 32 years. They were making great money. They were making great strides. Wickedness was everywhere, but they were having fun at it. And 32 years later, never having had another word of the Lord, the Assyrians came in, slaughtered thousands, starved thousands, took thousands of slaves, tied them behind camels, and dragged them back to Assyria. And Israel was no more. Not a famine of bread, nor of thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Do you have a Bible in your house? Some of you maybe have five or ten of them. In today's world, you can even have one of these smartphones, and you've got a Bible app right on the phone. But what good does it do if you've got five, ten Bibles in the house unless you're using it. And what good does it do to have a Bible app on your phone if every other app seems to catch attention first? And then, and then we are in a weird world, aren't we? It's a strange world, don't you think? trying to comply with the government's wishes in this regard or that regard. Some churches have even gone to the point where they take the Bibles out of the pews and the hymn books out of the pews, lest, lest some little COVID virus be attached to the Bible and jump off the page at some other worshiper a week later. Never mind, check it out medically, that's impossible.
What would you do if you had no Bible? Mind you, the Bible always points to the Christ, and the Christ is the Word of God, whom to know was life eternal, and to know, not know Him as death eternal. Did you catch that polarization? To know Christ as life eternal, to not know Him as death eternal, unless there's a conversion. Not a famine of bread, nor of thirst of water, but of the hearing the words of the Lord. Allow me to go back again to the testimony I've heard with my own ears out of the mouths of Christians in Russia and the Ukraine. They all said the same thing. When in 1917, the socialist slash communist policies under Vladimir Lenin took hold, what were the first things that took place? Soon after they got power, they outlawed churches because communism was atheist. They padlocked some churches and they burned down some other churches and they turned some churches into museums and they turned other churches into granaries. They passed other laws saying it was illegal for Christians to gather together for worship. They passed other laws. It was illegal for Christians to have uh, Bibles in their homes. And it was illegal, forbidden, for Christians to testimony, give testimony to others on the street or hey, hey, friends because, because that was called committing a crime against the state. What would you do if your church was padlocked? What would you do if, if you were accused of being criminal against the state to be taken into court and to be sent off to prison? Something also that struck us, both Ukraine and Russia, and that is the extensive reach of the gulags under Stalin and Khrushchev. Something like over 224 of them, prison camps. I would like to relay to you a vision I had, a scene I saw in the city of Tumen. 1,100 miles east of Moscow, in Siberia. Knowing, of course, that Tumen is on that, that east-west Siberian railroad. There's a bridge, a pedestrian walk bridge over the top of that railroad station. And that railroad station at that point has 10 or 12 or 14 tracks, I don't remember how many. And as my wife and I stood on that bridge in the center of Tumen, we could envision for ourselves, looking to the west, 1,100 miles, and all of the Christians that went in cattle cars over those miles and under the bridge onto the gulags. And then we turn around and look to the east. And think 4,000 miles to the Pacific Ocean. And all the gulags and all the suffering and all the death that took place. All because they were declared enemies of the state. We are in a strange world. For a while this summer. And I say this gently, but you know it's the truth. For a while this summer, you could go to a Walmart, you could go to a Myers, you could go to a Lowe's, but only certain aisles. You could go to a Home Depot, but only certain aisles. 
You could go to the liquor store because you had a stock up. You could go to the marijuana store because that was uh, deemed essential. And you could go to the abortion clinic because, because that was declared essential for life. But in that same time period, many of the churches were closed down by force and schools and whatnot all. And some states would like to see churches remain closed. Folks, we are in a strange world. And there's a form of famine in the land. Back to the text. Not a famine of bread or a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So the question is, how much do you crave God's word? How much do you love the bread of life? How much do you yearn to drink daily from the water of life? And then, dear Christian, may you always know that the Lord will provide according to your needs if only your hunger is there. And remember as well that the Lord wants you to pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for your family. Pray for your grandchildren, grandpa and grandma. They are facing stuff you never dreamed of. Pray for your local church. Pray for your state. Pray for your country. Pray for your world. Even when the famine is severe. Time to pray, folks. Lord, there's so many times in life we don't even know how to pray. But this we know. You are providing for your children and you always will. Strengthen every single one here. The old timers that might be within five or ten years from stepping off this planet and being ushered into your holy presence. Bless also, Lord, the younger ones that are in the thick of life and have to give guidance for the youngest generation for the future. Bless the Lord these young people here. Oh, how delightful it is to see their young faces gathered around your word and soaking in your word. Grant, Lord, that they might have a hunger for your word like never before, and they might outshine their parents and their grandparents again and again. Grant, O oh Lord, your blessing and all of your children the world around. And then, O oh Lord, haste the day when our faith shall be sight, and the clouds be rolled back like a scroll. And haste the day when we shall join that heavenly throng. And sit at your banquet table where the food shall never run out. No one shall ever go hungry. And we shall be able to bask in the teaching of you, our Lord, Redeemer, and King. Till then, Lord, make us faithful to your cause. In Jesus' name. Amen. From our blue Psalter hymnals, number 407, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Mm -hmm. 